The letter came on the first of the month, as usual. It was written, as most of them were, in near calligraphic style, in indigo blue ink, on see-through airmail paper. Ma chère Nadine, we are so happy to have this occasion to put pen to paper to write to you. How are you? All is well with us, grâce à Dieu, except your father, whose health is, as always, unreliable. Today it is his knees. Tomorrow it will be something else. You know how it is when you are old. He and I both thank you for the money you sent last month. We know it is difficult for you, but we are grateful. This month your father hopes to see yet another doctor. We have not heard your voice in a while and our ears ache for it. Please call us. She signed it, your mother and father, who embrace you very tightly. Three weeks had gone by since the letter arrived, and Nadine still hadn't called. She had raided her savings to wire double the usual amount, but hadn't called. Instead, she took the letter out each day as she ate a tuna melt for lunch in the hospital cafeteria, where each first Friday for the last two years, she had added a brownie to her meal for scheduled variety. Every time she read the letter, she tried to find something else between the lines, a note of sympathy, commiseration, condolence, but it simply wasn't there. The more time went by, the more brittle and fragile the letter became. Each time she held the paper between her fingers, she wondered how her mother had not torn it with the pen she'd used to compose each carefully inscribed word. How had the postal workers in both Port-au-Prince and Brooklyn not lacerated the thin page and envelope? And how had the letter not turned to dust while rubbing against the lining of the left pocket of her nurse's uniform during the bus ride to work, or in her purse and her locker in the artificial heat all day long? She carefully folded the letter once again and replaced it in her purse as one of her colleagues approached a small corner table by the window that she occupied in solitude for a whole hour each working day. The colleague, Josette, kissed her on both cheeks while fumbling in her pocket for lunch money. As Nadine's lunch hour was winding down, Josette's was just beginning. Nadine smiled both at Josette and to herself at this ability of Josette's to make an ordinary encounter feel so intimate, then turned her face to the view outside, to the brown buildings and their barred windows coated with a thin sheet of early January frost. She let her eyes linger on the nursing station of the psych ward across the alley and entertained a vision she often had of seeing a patient dive out of one of the windows. Would she leap out of her chair, run to the elevator down to the alley separating the two buildings, or would she simply sit there and finish the last quarter glass of her skim milk? Ms. Hines is back from ICU, Josette was saying. She's so saisy about not being able to talk that Dr. Vega had to give her a sedative. Nadine and Josette worked both ends of ear, nose, and throat and saw many post-op patients wake up bewildered to discover that their total laryngectomies meant that they would no longer be able to use their voices to communicate. No matter how the doctors and nurses prepared them, it was still a shock. Josette always gave Nadine a report on the patients when she came to take over the table. She was one of the younger Haitian RNs, one of those who came to Brooklyn in early childhood and spoke English with no accent at all, but she liked to throw in a Creole word here and there in conversation to flaunt her origins. Aside from the brief lunch encounters and times when one or other needed a bit of extra help with a patient, they barely spoke at all. I'm going now, Nadine said, rising from her seat. My throne is yours. When she returned to her one-bedroom condo in Canarsie that evening, Nadine was greeted by voices from the large television set that she kept turned on 24 hours a day. Along with the uneven piles of newspapers and magazines scattered between the fold-out couch and the floor-to-ceiling bookshelves in her living room, the television was her way of bringing voices into her life that required neither reaction 
nor response. At 32, she had tried other hobbies, jogging, journal writing, drawing, internet surfing, but these tasks had demanded either too much effort or too much superficial interaction with other people. She took off the white sneakers that she wore at work and remained standing to watch the last few minutes of a news broadcast. It wasn't until a game show had begun that she pressed the playback button on her beeping answering machine. Her one message was from Eric, her former beau, suitor, lover, the near father of her nearly born child. Allo, allo, hello, he stammered, creating his own odd pauses between Creole, French, and English, like the electively mute, newly arrived immigrant children whose worried parents brought them in for consultations, even though there was nothing wrong with their vocal cords. Haven't heard from you. He chose English. Long pause. Okay, bye. Whenever he called her now, which was about once a month since their breakup, she removed the microcassette from the answering machine and placed it on the altar she had erected on the top of the dresser in her bedroom. It wasn't anything too elaborate. There was a framed drawing that she had made of a cocoa brown, dewy-eyed baby that could as easily have been a boy as a girl, the plump, fleshy cheeks resembling hers and the high forehead resembling his. Next to the plain wooden frame were a dozen now-dried red roses that Eric had bought her as they'd left the clinic after the procedure. She had once read about a shrine to unborn children in Japan, where water was poured over little altars of stone to honor them. So she had filled her favorite drinking glass with water and a small pebble, and had added that to her own shrine, along with a total of now three micro-cassettes with messages from Eric, messages she had never returned. That night, the apartment seemed oddly quiet in spite of the TV voices. She took out her mother's letter for its second reading of the day, ran her fingers down the delicate page, and reached for the phone to dial her parents' number. She had almost called many times in the last three months, but had lost her nerve, thinking that her voice might betray all that she could not say. She nearly dialed the whole thing this time. There were only a few numbers left when she put the phone down, tore the letter in two, then four, then eight, then countless pieces, collapsed among her old magazines and newspapers, and wept quietly. Another letter arrived at Nadine's house a week later. It was on the same kind of airmail paper, but this time the words were meticulously typed. The A's and O's, which had been struck over many times, created underlayers, shadows, and small holes within the vowel's perimeters. Ma chère Nadine, your father and I thank you very much for the extra money. Your father used it to see a doctor, not about his knees, but his prostate that the doctor says is inflamed. Not to worry, he was given some medications and it seems as if he will be fine for a while. All the tests brought us short for the monthly expenses, but we will manage. We would like so much to talk to you. We wait every Sunday afternoon hoping that you will return to our beautiful routine. We pray that we have not abused your generosity, but you are our only child and we only ask for what we need. You know how it is when you are old. We have tried to call you, but we are always greeted by your answering machine. In any case, we wait to hear from you, your mother and father who embrace you tightly. The next day, Nadine ignored her tuna melt altogether to read the letter over many times. She did not even notice the lunch hour pass, and Josette was standing over her at the table sooner than she expected. Josette, like all the other nurses, knew not to ask any questions about Nadine's past, present, future, or her international-looking mail. Word circulated quickly from old employees to new arrivals 
that Nadine Marie Osnak was not a friendly woman. Anyone who had sought detailed conversations with her or who had shown interest in sharing the table while she was sitting there had met only with cold silence and a blank stare out to the psych ward where the winter frost was still clinging to the window bars. Josette, however, still occasionally ventured a social invitation since they were both from the same country and all. Some of the girls are going to the city after work, Josette was saying. A little bamboosh to celebrate Ms. Hines' discharge tomorrow. No thanks, Nadine said, departing from the table a bit more abruptly than usual. That same afternoon, Ms. Hines began throwing things across her small private room, one of the few in the ward. Nadine nearly took a flower vase in the face as she rushed in to help. Unlike the other patients in the ward, Ms. Hines was a non-smoker. She was also much younger, 25 years old. When Nadine arrived, Ms. Hines was thrashing about so much that the nurses, worried that she would yank out the metal tube inserted in her neck and suffocate, were trying to pin her down to put restraints on her arms and legs. Nadine quickly joined in the struggle, assigning herself Ms. Hines' right arm, pockmarked from months of IVs in hard-to-conquer veins. Where's Dr. Vega? Josette shouted as she caught one of Ms. Hines' random kicks in her chest. Nadine lost her grip on the IV arm. She was looking closely at Ms. Hines' face, her eyes tightly shut beneath where her eyebrows used to be her thinner lower lip protruding defiantly past her upper one as though she were preparing to spit long distance in a contest, her whole body hairless under the cerulean blue hospital gown which came with neither a bonnet nor a hat to protect her now completely bald head. The doctor's on his way, one of the male nurses said. He had a firm hold of Ms. Hines' left leg but could not pin it down to the bed long enough to restrain it. Leave her alone, Nadine finally suggested to the others. They all looked up at her at the same time, their own exhaustion and frustration forcing them to release Ms. Hines' extremities. One by one, they slipped a few steps back to protect themselves. With her need to struggle suddenly gone, Ms. Hines coiled into a fetal position and sank into the middle of the bed. Let me be alone with her, Nadine said. The others lingered a while, as if not wanting to leave, but they had other patients to see to, so, one at a time, they backed out the door. Ms. Hines, is there something you want to tell us? Nadine lowered the bed rail to give Ms. Hines a limited sense of freedom. Ms. Hines opened her mouth wide, trying to force air past her lips, but all that came out was the hiss of oxygen and mucus filtering through the tube in her neck. Nadine looked over at the night table, where there should have been a pad and pen, but Ms. Hines had knocked them over onto the floor with the flower arrangements and magazines her parents had brought for her. Nadine walked over and picked up the pad and pen and handed them to Ms. Hines. I'm here, Ms. Hines. Go ahead. Ms. Hines grabbed the pad eagerly, scribbled down a few quick words, then held it up for Nadine to read. At first, Nadine could not understand the handwriting. It was unsteady and hurried, and the words ran together, but she sounded them out, one at a time, with some encouragement from Ms. Hines, who moved her head a few inches up and down when Nadine guessed correctly. I cannot speak, Nadine made out. That's right, Nadine said. You cannot express yourself the way you used to. Ms. Hines grabbed the pad again and scribbled another sentence. I am an elementary school teacher. I know, Nadine said. Why are they sending me home like this? We are sending you home, Nadine said, because we have done all we can for you here. Now you must work with a speech therapist. You can get an artificial larynx, a voice box, 
There are many options. The speech therapist will help you. It was a pep talk that Nadine hated giving to the patients. The you will make it after all talk. That night at home, Nadine found herself more exhausted than usual. With a television movie as white noise, she dialed Eric's home phone number, hoping that she was finally ready to hear his voice for more than the 25 seconds her answering machine allowed. His wife answered the phone, and to avoid initiating a conversation, Nadine listened. She listened to the many hellos of the wife, and she listened to the wife's own television in the background, which was on a different channel than hers. She heard something drop, maybe a dinner plate that the wife was picking up from the family table after a meal. She listened to a young child's voice scream, Papi, papi, mommy broke something. And at last, she heard Eric's voice growing louder, moving closer to the phone, speaking gently to his wife in French. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a, chérie? Then she heard the transfer from the wife's breath to his, and she hoped that perhaps he would recognize her breathing on the other end of the line, but he said his own series of hellos and then hung up. She picked up the phone again to call him back to say something predictable like, it is time she knew, but maybe the wife already knew, so she decided to call her parents instead. Talking to them always made her wish for a life, where children were parented even after they had married and moved into a house down the street. Ten years ago, her parents had sold everything they owned, had moved from what passed for a lower middle class neighborhood to one on the edge of a slum, in order to send her to nursing school abroad. Ten years ago, she had dreamed of seeing the world, of making her own way in it. Ten years ago, she had desired her solitude more than anything. These were the intangibles that she had proposed to her mother, the seamstress, and her father, the camion driver, in the guise of a nursing career. This is what they had sacrificed everything for. But she always knew that she would repay them, and she had, with half her salary every month, and sometimes more. In return, what she got was the chance to parent them, rather than have them parent her. Talking to them, however, always made her wish to be the one guarded rather than the guardian, to be reassured now and then that some wounds could heal, that some decisions would not haunt her forever. Mama, her voice immediately dropped to a whisper when her mother's came over the phone line, squealing with happiness. Papa, it is Nadine. For every decibel Nadine's voice dropped, her mother's rose. My love, we were so worried about you. How are you? We were so worried. I am fine, Mama. You sound cold. You sound down. We have to start planning again when you can come or we can come see you. As soon as Papa can travel. How is Papa? He is right here. Let me put him on. He would be very glad to speak with you. Suddenly, her father was on the phone, his tone calmer, but excited in its own way. We were waiting so long for this call, Cherie. I know, Papa. I'm sorry I haven't called. They never spoke of sad and difficult things there in these phone calls, of money or illness or doctor's visits. Papa always downplayed his aches and pains, which her mother would detail in the letters. There was no time for anything but joy. Events were relayed briefly, a list of accomplishments, no discussion of failures or pain, which could spoil moods for days, weeks, and months until the next phone call. Do you have a boyfriend her mother took back the phone. Nadine could imagine her skipping around their living room like a child's ball bouncing. Is there anyone in your life? I have to go, Mama. So soon? I work early tomorrow. I promise I will call again. The next day, 
Nadine watched as Ms. Hines packed her things and changed into a bright yellow oversized sweatsuit and matching cap while waiting for the doctor to come and sign her discharge papers. My mother bought me this hideous outfit, Ms. Hines wrote on the pad, which was now half filled with words, commands to the nurses, updates to her parents left over from the previous afternoon's visit. Ms. Hines climbed up on the bedside closer to the door, her bony legs dangling. She reached up and stroked the protruding tip of the metal tube in her neck. Is someone coming for you? Nadine asked. My parents, she wrote. Good, Nadine said. The doctor will be here soon. Nadine spent half her lunch hour staring at the barred windows on the brown building across the alley, watching the psych nurses scribbling in charts and filing them, rushing to answer sudden calls from the ward. No one would ever get past the wall of nurses to reach the window and dive to the alley, she realized, unless it was a nurse with a blowtorch and a death wish. Josette walked up to the table earlier than usual, obviously looking for her. What is it? Nadine asked. C'est Miss Hines, said Josette. She would like to say goodbye to you. She thought of asking Josette to tell Ms. Hines that she could not be found, but fearing that this would create some type of conspiratorial camaraderie between them, decided against it. Ms. Hines and her parents were waiting by the elevator bank in the ward. Ms. Hines was sitting in a wheelchair with her discharge papers and a white plastic bag full of odds and ends on her lap. Her father, a strapping, hulking man was clutching the back of the wheelchair with moist, nervous hands, which gripped the chair more tightly for fear of losing hold. The mother, a plump, fleshy woman whose height nearly matched the father's, looked as though she were fighting back cries, tears, a tempest of anger, barters with God. Instead, she fussed trying to wrench the discharge papers and the white plastic bag from her daughter, irritating Miss Hines, who raised her pad from beneath the pile of papers and scribbled quickly, Nurse Osnak, these are my parents, Carol and Justin Hines. Nadine shook each parent's hand in turn. Glad to make your acquaintance, said the father. The mother said nothing. Thank you for everything, said the father. Please share our thanks with the doctors, the other nurses, everyone. The elevator doors suddenly opened, and they found themselves staring at the bodies that filled it to capacity. The doctors and nurses traveling between floors, the walking patients from floors above them, the visitors. The Heinzes let the doors close, and the others departed without them. Ms. Hines turned to an empty page toward the back of her pad and wrote, Goodbye, Nurse Osnak. Good luck, Nadine said. Another elevator opened. There were fewer people in it this time and enough room for all the Heinzes and the discharge nurse. The father pushed a wheelchair, which jerked forward, nearly dumping Ms. Hines face first into the elevator. The elevator doors closed behind them sharply, leaving Nadine alone facing a distorted reflection of herself in the wide, shiny metal surface. She thought of her parents, of Eric, of the pebble in the glass of water in her bedroom at home, all of those things belonging to the widened, unrecognizable woman staring back at her from the closed doors. That was Juno Diaz reading Water 